She said that American soccer fans, most of them aren't smart. They don't know the game. They don't understand. Geo, Geo, Geo. That guy is It's to take a lame gorilla, okay? It's like, did you know that Arsenal? He died. He's got me frozen. Up the top. He's, it's hard to up on them anyway. I, I'm just going to comment on that. <laughs> Welcome back to Footy What's with up? the Boys, episode 100 here of yeah. Footy with the Boys. Yeah. This is a Get special it. episode. We'll have special guest Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi at the oh, end. Shit. So uh, make sure you keep watching, Crazy. subscribe, like, comment, do everything. 100th episode, extravaganza starts now with the big news. Boys, Manchester City was going to draw today until Michael Tracy decides to text <laughs> that Wolves are doing God's work and the Jinx Gods got to work, allowing John Stones to have a last second, not even minute equalizer, not equalizer, winner against Wolves. Nick, has has Mike ruined your Sunday completely here? Um, yeah. Let's say it's Mike. I no, no one else had anything to do with it. <laughs> let's say it was it was Rock just Mike. Did it. What a fucking let's say it was just Mike who uh, who kicked me while I'm down, dude. What a fucking yeah. No, name. you do suck for. I don't know why you would send that message before the game ends. You're a uh, yeah. Player, is what it the is. Timing goes unreal. I think it was like <laughs> ten seconds between I sent the text and the equal or the winner came. It, it was crazy. Yeah, I no, as soon as you sent the text, as soon as you sent the text, I turned it off because I knew it was about to happen. So <laughs> yeah. I fucked yeah. up. John Stones yeah. is a hell of a name. John Stones very English has got some stones. Uh boys, that, former that winner though. Former Toffee, that is true. That that's what led him through is Mike's jinxing text through his Toffee powers. Sent it over to Johnny Stones, and he got the message loud and clear. Uh, Come home, Johnny. Should the goal have counted is maybe more the, the bigger question than if or if not Mike Jinx did. He certainly did. But Bernardo Silva, the little man he is, as Jack Grealish was saying to the ref, he was like, oh, he's so short. He couldn't have been interfering with the play in an obvious offsides position right in front of the keeper. It goes to the monitor, Nick. Usually if it goes to the monitor, that's indicating that they think they've made a mistake and the referee should go take a look to change it. The ref doesn't. The goal stands. Manchester City win. Sus? Uh, that's not the only sus thing that happened this weekend, but we'll uh, we'll get into that shortly. Listen, VAR is not, is not there for any other reason aside to uh, give an extra nudge to those citizens in sky blue over in manchester so i think uh i think it's well established what they are and you know we can keep bitching about it or we can accept it and understand that there's an uphill battle so that's kind of where i'm at the acceptance stage of my grief yeah mike you were part of the jinx here was it is that the reason why the var couldn't be overturned despite him being sent to the monitor i mean bernardo silva is short but it is a tall task to get over a jinx as much as, as you've done. I know Man City lover, I'm no citizen. I I don't see any problem with this one. Like the goalie's not looking at Bernardo Silva whatsoever. He this picture looks worse. He's like way further left than the goalkeeper's standing. Um he's not really even in front of him. He is not a way further left. He's like two feet. Dude, he's not in line with him. Doing it, his it, best he's out of the way. Impression yeah. on the left here. <laughs> like that yeah, place. if if it impacted the goalkeeper whatsoever, offside, easy. This does not. I mean, it's just a goal. For what it's for what it's worth, I do think I do think the goal was clean. But no one's talking about. Uh, I don't even know who it was, but Wolves just got absolutely dogged right before on the counter before like four corners in a row. There should have been a foul before Man City had a counter attack. There's, it does feel like Arsenal gets screwed a lot. It feels like Wolves get screwed a lot by refereeing oh, in general. So, <laughs> it's tough. They look good, though. Well, Gary O'Neill said, uh, said after the game, 
he was like, uh, yeah, I think it's just easier for big six sides to get the call. If I think if the tables were reversed, then we might have gotten that goal taken off. And I think I agree with him in this one, at least I don't know about big six, but definitely when it comes to some oil money. Yeah, I mean, the big Probably names get the calls. There. Nick, also Arnie Schlott calling off the referees. A whole lot of calling out of referees. Yeah, well, Arnie Schlott in the in the Chelsea game, uh, a very interesting, some may say subjective call to to give a yellow to someone dragging someone down at the halfway line. Uh, a similar situation happened yesterday in a game that will remain unnamed. Uh, in that game, which involved uh, a team very close to my heart that will remain unnamed, uh, whose jersey I might be wearing, but will remain unnamed. Uh, there was a red card given to that team, which will remain unnamed. Uh, but in this game, there was not a red card given, which is very interesting for two reasons. One, Liverpool being a main rival of a certain uh, indestructible side over in Manchester. And two, the team that gets the yellow instead of a red is also funded by oil money. So interesting. At least they were initially very interesting um, that that things seem to be developing in a certain way. It, it never takes long to feel vindication whenever you feel like you get screwed as a, as a fan of Arsenal because the exact same thing always happens the very next day and it never goes the way that everyone says it has to against us. Yeah, you will also see it a billion times on Twitter because that, that Arsenal Twitter community just... They will have receipts Demons. of every game of the last 10 years of the exact oh, yeah. same thing not being called, there is nothing our that part. they do not find. <laughs> yeah, they, listen, our if, part. if refereeing needs to find They'll precedence find on every single foul, one of them, they will. They will certainly do that. And Nick, it was a perfect segue into our summary of what happened uh, with Arsenal this weekend against the Cherries of Bournemouth. A 2-0 loss, and a big part of that is that red card to William Saliba there before Bournemouth capitalized with two goals uh, to close this one out. It really sucks to drop any type of points in any type of game in a, this hot of a title race, in this crazy era of the Premier League. But to have a red card that early impacts so much of a game. What did you see in this one? Obviously, an unnamed player you were talking about earlier. Maybe we name him here. <laughs> Listen, I think I think we have to... I'll give you my thoughts on the game in a second because, yes, Arsenal drop all three points. Uh, I think the game was there to at least be tied or won. I think there were issues before the game even started with the lineup, which we'll get into. But we have to talk about this red card first. Guys, it's given a yellow on the field. VAR phones in... Sorry, excuse me. Howard Webb from the stands phones in <laughs> and then... VAR phones the ref, interesting, uh, that then you take another look at a subjective call. They come back, a red card is shown to William Saliba. Here's my stance. You guys can disagree with me if you want. I'm obviously biased. I think it's pretty 50-50 if it's a yellow or red card. I really, I don't know if Saliba gets there. He's a pacey guy. Ben White had coverage. I don't know if he gets there. Maybe Evan Nielsen gets there and he's in on a breakaway denial. I don't, I really don't know what happens, but it's a 50 50 call to me. And what we've been told about VAR is that they are not here to re referee a game, that they are there just to help out in certain decisions. Well, in a very subjective call, a yellow was given on the field. Again, it could have been a yellow, could have been a red. I, I don't disagree. If he would have given a straight red, I, I think I'd be less pissed. I'm not even super pissed, but. The weird part is that VAR calls in, says, take a look at it. And then the subjective, like he saw nothing different on the field to what he saw on the monitor or red is given. So that to me feels a little bit suspicious. Other things add to the suspicion. Howard Webb in the stands <laughs> putting his fucking finger to his ear as soon as it happens. I'm sure it had nothing to do with the game, but not a good look. Uh, other things like um, this Chelsea decision being given a yellow. I mean, the fact that for half of this season, I have watched my team down to 10 men also makes me more suspicious. 
Am I crazy to think that the yellow was given, the yellow should have stayed, it should not have been changed to a red? What do you think, Trace? No, I, I think you're right. I'm. It's hard for me to believe that he changes it to a red after watching it. I mean, I get given the red. Son of a All bitch. right. <laughs> this this, fucking this guy. guy's the internet. Fuck my internet. Stuff. Fuck my internet. Oh my um, but when you it's slowed down, giving a red. how could you say it's a red? I mean, there's minimal contact. You see Evan Nelson's going down as soon as he knows he's touched. Yes, Salva shouldn't be making that play. I think he's got the Stupid pace. Decision. I think, think he gains on him. Um, percent. But turning it over because of that and seeing the slow motion, I, I don't get it. I think I think the flags and correct me if I'm wrong from what from what uh from what Mike said a couple weeks ago when I was way more mad about the Declan Rice thing that one was egregious. This one I, I'm not coming here with the same vitriol because again I do think it's a 50 50 call. But Mike said why even put yourself in a position to give the ref that call and that's what kept going through my head as we were watching the VAR because I knew as soon as we went to VAR I was going to give the red. There was no way that that they were going to let Arsenal off free. And William Saliba, our Rolls Royce defender, who has not been dribbled past once this entire season, makes just a stupid, stupid decision on the road when things are already difficult in the Premier League against a feisty cherry side, if not an incredible cherry side, who, I mean, two good goals. So just a horrible decision by Saliba. Do you think a lot of the blame falls on him or is it our Arsenal fans on Twitter really right to keep retweeting this Chelsea yellow card? I mean, I think it it somewhat goes both ways because, like you are saying, he is putting himself in that position where it is 50-50. And if they gave that red immediately, you'd probably say, well, shit, that sucks. But, yeah, okay. It is ex- also extremely stupid that it's a yellow card and then they go to VAR and upgrade it because it is, like you said, it's a subjective decision. And I understand there's certain things like penalties that are – like, I mean, get, basically everything is, I guess, somewhat subjective other than offsides. But, I mean, it, it's it's re-refereeing. He chose to give a yellow. And I agree with that. Like, I, it may not be absolutely correct decisions all the time. But I am always in the camp of do not have the referee make a gigantic stamp on a game. If you can make it, if he, the player, is not forcing you to make a gigantic game-altering choice don't make a gigantic game altering choice. And that's what the referee did. But then it comes down to VAR and they say, Hey, no, have a look at this. And with that, that is a suggestion that, Hey, you should change this. If he's being sent to the monitor, similar to what we said with man city, it it's them saying you should change this. It didn't change. Then he's stuck with his guns. I think he maybe should have done the same here. He has to be in control of his own match, not VAR re refereeing. Also, what you're saying is so true. This idea of like refs constantly telling us they don't want to change the state of the game. Well, three times now over Trossard kicking a ball away that like we he thought he was still playing. Declan Rice towing a ball after he get and then gets like absolutely kicked. His ACL almost goes. And now this like they're making an impact in Arsenal games. (laughs) And it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, Again, I, I like I said, I don't think that everything can be put down to this. A couple of things I really didn't like about this game outside of it. One, I hated the starting 11. Very happy to see Mikel Marino in, in the starting 11. I think he's class. He, he actually had a good game uh, this this past, or yesterday, I guess. But a, a midfield of Marino, Party, and Rice just has zero juice to it as far as any attacking talent. Pair that with Sterling and Trossard on the wings. Like, there's not really a lot of dynamicism there. I didn't like that decision. I've Ethan Wineri seems like an absolute wonder kid of wonder kids. And he, Arteta is just, I mean, he sold ESR. He loaned out Fabio Vieira. The whole idea was to give this guy a chance. Odegaard's out for already a month and probably another month. He hasn't started a single game. So what I don't understand what we're doing. Um, if you want to start Tross out of there, I get the seniority thing. But now you're doing a midfield with no creativity. Even when Wineri came on with 10 men, he looked like the best player on the pitch, and I, I thought it was surprising to not see him go. Don't think you can blame injuries. Sucks not to have Saka, but it's what it is. You can't rely on him every game. The biggest thing, of course, is the Gabriel Martinelli missed chance. He 
could have slotted away down a man and then Arsenal could have shit housed their way like with that low block that they're exceptional at shoots a decent shot a pretty decent save from Keppa but at the end of the day if you're a striker uh, or an attacking winger a second striker that I kind of see Martinelli as you have to put that ball away inside someone else's 18 with no one in front of you so I don't Arsenal shoot the themselves in the foot yeah Arsenal shoot themselves in the foot um still hard not to feel cheated but a bad weekend all around a bad weekend and we'll move forward after this i don't mean to to rub more salt in but the upcoming games liverpool newcastle chelsea where is the panic meter because this is three dropped points i understand that other results could have helped if mike didn't jinx but it is a, a hotly contested race and your Dropping three points ahead of what might be the toughest stretch you guys see here, and including an Inter Milan Champions League match in between there. So, how tough does this get now? I mean, incredibly so. I'm pretty sure that Newcastle game's away. Odegaard won't be back for any of these. Maybe the Chelsea game. It's it's going to be rough. Obviously, we're going to have to see some rotation. We're going to have to see Mineri playing. Sorry? Is it too early to say a make or break stretch for Arsenal here? These How can games? you say it's too early for make or We lost the title by two points last year after going on like uh, 15 wins out of 16 games run. <laughs> like, how, can you, how can you possibly say that it's too early to make or break? We're already four points off City, five points off the pace. Again, it's it's tough not to feel cheated. I, I, I understand there were mistakes that we made, but it... It's settling in already. That feeling that I had after Aston Villa last year where we lost for the first time in forever, like it, that feeling of I know what's going to happen, it's already here. And, and unless something turns around soon from what I'm seeing, honestly, just from the league, like not even what how City's playing. I don't think they've been amazing, if I'm being honest, but they do have the extra boost of having the fucking federation on their side. So... I don't know. It, it it does feel make or break. Nine points in these next out of these next nine will will be a huge boost to confidence. But I I think we'll we'll fight hard. I think we'll contend for all nine of those points. If you get nine out of nine against Liverpool, and Newcastle, and Chelsea, that's a huge accomplishment. Seven out of nine is pretty good. I, I it does feel make or break. I don't think you're off the mark at all. Yeah, and certainly I think one of the things you're saying is this: it's about the league and. There's been a lot of teams that just have not been much of a challenge for the top team. So it is a race to somewhat be perfect uh, right now. And that was that was one of the one of the reasons, Mike, why Everton, despite a horrible start to the season, have rebounded very well here and find themselves in not too bad of a position as they just beat Ipswich Town two to zero in DI, getting a goal here. He's been a star for us. Everton seems to now have figured out something that they can close out some games. It's maybe not the most impressive result here against Ipswich, but it's it's more points. They get up to eight. Is this is this a sign of of them distancing themselves from the, the relegation scrap, or do you do you still think Everton is is in the the absolute thick of it? We're definitely not in the thick of it. I mean, there's four teams who haven't won a game still. Crystal Palace yet to play this week. Um, but I think we're quite a bit better than Southampton, Ipswich, um, and Wolves. Uh, just class of player-wise. Um, Wolves look good. And Could have used yeah, that point. Sure, I guess. We Thank have a legit you, player. NDI and Dwight McNeil, two legit players. Really in some fine form right now creating everything for us up top. Both of them heavily involved in this game as well. Um, this man is magic. I mean, he really is fun, fun Most player important. to watch. Wasn't sure what we were getting. Most important is a tough one. Um, I still think it's going to be one of the center backs by the end of the season because in those big games, um, scraping out draws in, in games that we shouldn't get results in, um, those are the things that kind of define a season for us that'll come down to hard defending. Um, and I think it'll be a Tarkovsky. It'll be a Branthwaite. Uh, but Michael Keane. attacking wise, Michael Keane, shout out, Michael Keane, a striker in a center back's body. 
that was an absolute blast from the past. Roofer, uh, tight ball from McNeil, skies it. Can't say a bad word about him. I mean, he's looked good the last two games. You know I'm not a fan. Um, but if he puts in a performance like that, sure. Just if he scores goals. Brant Thwaites back. Scoring goals he can is make great. Up for it's it. more than he, Dom he can, can do. make up. It's more than any of our strikers are doing at the moment. Um, I'm feeling good. Uh, this is great. We it was not a pretty match. Man, this man's internet is worse than if switched down. We were fighting for our lives. <laughs> oh, this is and brutal. He's back. <laughs> back. We were fighting for our lives. You were fighting staying. for our lives. The the end of the match. Uh, Delap had a good shot on goal or just off goal that easily could have gone in. Um, we were really crammed in our own box, just playing boot. Uh, but dudes worked their ass off. I thought we should have seen more subs out of Deitch. That's another thing I'm going to keep harping on. He doesn't give these guys rests at all. Mikolenko was fried for the last 25 minutes of the game. Um, Dwight McNeil was covering his ass, which was fantastic to see. But we have some depth in the roster. Um, maybe not skilled players, but guys who can see out a match um, and, and run. So adjustments towards the end of the game is something I'd like to see. Yeah. I mean, I think we've, we've found with Everton – the players that need to be on the field where I think a lot of that, that play early on and how bad it was, was his reliance on last season's 11 and not bringing in the new players, not bringing in the players that make the gigantic differences like a an DI and, and not trusting those new signings yet. And now I feel as though they found, they found that 11. Do you, do you think this is kind of the 11? Obviously some players through injury are going to make their way in. Is it, is this the 11? Is there a change at striker you want to make anywhere else? I think striker's still up for grabs, depending if someone finds form. Still yet to see Broha. Um, I think everywhere else, pretty cemented. Um, maybe two spots up for grabs, like a CDM spot, depending if James Garner's healthy, wasn't available this match. I think he could be a starter. Ghana Gay doesn't have the legs anymore. Played okay this match, but I don't think we can rely on him to be in every single week. And then the right wing is still a toss-up. Jack Harrison played this one, looked fine, worked hard, um, had a couple of decent balls into the box, but Lindstrom's right on his heels. He started a few matches. Um, I think we could see those two guys swap. It's not set. Harrison put in the ball that ended up with Ndaya goal, right? That was a good ball. Yes. Yes, it was a I, kind I of a scrappy he's, goal, he's the worst option, but. Um, but the ball did initially come from him. He's not a bad option. I just yeah. don't think he's a locked-in He's just not a good option. I don't think he's he's boosting it much. <laughs> yeah. I just don't think he's really push it, pushing it, you know? He's a work-rate player. Yeah. He's Most solid. I don't think he's better than you give him credit for. I don't think so. He just, he just can't be the guy. Like, he can't be, he can't be your third or fourth guy, <laughs> but he's a solid player. <laughs> If he's, he's the fourth if he's, guy in a, in a four man attack. Yeah. But like, if we could make him our fifth or sixth. If, if, you know, if he's really not having to do absolutely anything but hustle, that's where we want to be. He put in a good, he's got a good left foot, guys. Come on. Okay. Dwight McNeil's got a good left yeah. foot. Dwight McNeil. Does. What a man. Uh, last shout out for an Everton player, Ashley Young. Look pretty class this game. Cheeky nutmeg oh. on the wing. Uh, some tight play. He's beating the age rumors. 39 years young. Class is Come permanent. Oh, he's not. <laughs> class is permanent. The streets will never forget. Uh, we go to the Premier League wrap-up. We start with a huge matchup. Liverpool-Chelsea. Liverpool coming out on top with Mohamed Salah goal in this one. 2-1. to one. Thought this could have been a chance for Chelsea to stake some type of claim to some more respect. Respectable performance, but they don't get uh, quite the, the three points they were looking for. Uh, Tottenham West Ham, 4 1 in this one. Mohamed Kudush gets the one for West Ham and gets a red card. Uh, West Ham not looking too hot this season. Uh, Sucks. It seems like we're saying that every single weekend is they are not looking up to what we thought they could have been. Manchester United were just another uh, victim of an early Brentford goal before they then also came back on Brentford. Brentford, 
man, if they could only play early and, and just – if it was golden goal, they might be top of the table. They score early and then just throw away leads like it's nobody's business. Brighton in a big matchup against Newcastle gets a 1-0 victory. Uh, Aston Villa versus Fulham. Two red cards in this one, one on both sides. Aston Villa ends up winning 3-1 to one in this one. Uh, and then Southampton versus Leicester here. Southampton had a two-goal lead. We're looking nice. I said, no, Southampton had figured it out. It's not Leicester City as shit. And it wasn't that Leicester City was sick. They were just waiting for dramatic appeal. They they turned it on 3-2 to two here. Another red card in this game. Seems to be a theme of the weekend. A whole lot of red cards being shown here. But Southampton, man, if you're not gonna if you're not gonna win a two nil game, it's gonna be some tough sailing, as us Everton fans do know. Uh, Mike, which one caught your eye uh, here? Some big matchups. Uh, the Fulham Villa game, I thought was pretty spicy. Um, Raúl Jiménez continues his hot hot form. Um, and then Villa took over the red cards, obviously contribute to this. Um, Ali Watkins looks like he's class. I mean, we've talked about John Duran all season, but Ali Watkins is still a cut above. He's, he's one of the better strikers in the prem period. Um, and showing that they could fight back and win a game, which we've been critical of. Nick, what game stood out to you? What, what headline do you take from the weekend? Shout out to Duran, who uh, who scored for Colombia over the international break. Smoke Chile. Uh, off the bench as well. Weird. This guy is super sub definition. Uh, Man U, how about the Red Devils? Getting a late goal there from one Rasmus Hoyland. They're back in it. Future of Argentina scored a goal as well to tie it up for them. Shout out to, shout out to the, the future of Argentina, Alejandro Gaspacho. Uh, so I thought that was an impressive result. Ten Hag looked relieved on the, on the sidelines once that Hoyland goal went in. I, are they going to be a little sneaky again? Just kind of get shit on for the first two months of the year like they did last year and then just sneakily work their way to uh, their worst finish ever, maybe? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, they, were, they were feisty by the end of the year last year, so maybe they're coming back. Who knows? Bees were buzzing, but couldn't hold the Red Devils. Yep. I would Shout out the oldest the midfield in the Premier League, Casemiro and Christian Eriksen. Ooh, baby. That's yeah. a double pivot right there. That is fitness. <laughs> I'm surprised neither of you guys said Tottenham 4-1 over West Ham here. <laughs> Tottenham only one point behind Chelsea, a team that is, is kind of on that good trajectory. Tottenham looking to kind of reestablish their trajectory. Big win here versus West Ham. And West Ham continue... A bit of a slide here. They're on eight points. Everton is also on eight points. The only difference is two goal differential. I mean, what what the hell is going on there at West Ham? You guys invested what I thought was in some good players. You have Kudush, who's an insanely good player. Firing David Moyes, maybe, uh, maybe proven to not be a good decision here, Nick. Yeah, I mean, you can't argue it was at this point. <laughs> they look atrocious. <laughs> um, Spurs, you know, I'm not going to give them too much credit because that's how bad this West Ham team has looked. And against every good team that they've played, Spurs have lost. So uh, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open, but points don't lie. They are, you know, they're in the race. So good for them, I guess. Yeah, they're, they're doing all right there. Uh, boys, let's get into the U.S. men's national team corner. I'm just going to start by... Pointing up to the man on the wall, Mr. Christian Pulisic at AC Milan. I mean, there's just no doubt at this point. Seven consecutive games with a goal or an assist. He gets an assist in this one to Samuel Chukweze in their 1-0 win over Udinese. Musa got a full 45 minutes as a sub in this one uh, because there was a red card. AC Milan played 10 men down. Pulisic was all over the field playing in the... The number 10 role in the midfield, absolutely balling out. Could have had another goal, could have had another assist. He was absurdly good in this one. Looked like he had a lot of energy. Maybe uh, 
Maybe that rest in that Mexico game paid off for him, but he is in some unreal form. He is the only player uh, to have seven straight games with a goal or an assist in Europe this year. He is also at 28 goals in the past two Serie A seasons, or 28 goals and assists in the last two oh, seasons. That's not right. <laughs> only, <laughs> only behind Laturo Martinez, who obviously has a little bit more of the club trophies and, and things behind his resume, but was certainly a shout for the Ballon d'Or. So you see Milan, maybe if you guys figure out how to actually win some games, we can have some Christian Pulisic realistic Ballon d'Or shouts next year. Uh, yeah. Tyler Adams, maybe he was the reason why uh, Bournemouth got the win against Arsenal. He was back on the bench and that's just the type of leader he is, the type of dog he is. He he Mentel, led awesome. Bournemouth to a win from the bench. I mean, yeah, that is our captain. Big, big uh-huh. signs though. All 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 joking aside, that is a massive sign because I think we're seeing that this US team needs some bite. Tyler Adams certainly brings that. Maybe a little bit too much for what his body can handle at times, but massive for him to be back, especially before an upcoming November international camp tim wea also joining him back uh, for juventus getting on for about 50 minutes or 40 minutes uh in juve's win McKenney was out for that one with his muscle whatever soreness injury fatigue uh and boys what we also learned after our loss to mexico in the last international friendly window was that Jamaica will be Mauricio Pochettino's first competitive matchup. He'll be facing them in Kingston, Jamaica in the quarterfinals of the Nations League before coming back to St. Louis to face them here at home in the second leg. Mike, Jamaica undefeated under uh, Steve McLaren, is that his name? Came over from Manchester United as their new coach. He's recruiting a lot. I believe Mason Greed would have said that he's... He's going to be coming over to Jamaica. How dangerous is this of a quarterfinal matchup here? Because playing away in CONCACAF, as we've learned, is just not a good thing for the American national team. We do get that second leg at home, though. Leave your girlfriends at home. It could be quite dangerous if Mason Greenwood is on the pitch. Um, <laughs> man, I'm kidding. But... Not really kidding. He's a piece of shit. <laughs> great player. Um, He's a rapist. <laughs> yeah, he is. Not a good guy. No, not, not a good guy. Not kidding. Talented. Not a good person. Not... Um, my hopes for this one, that we look significantly better than the last time we played Jamaica. We all remember that match. Um, took some Haji Wright heroics at the end to, to get a result there. Um, I'm expecting good things. I think we'll have a healthy roster or a more healthy roster, which is huge. Um, Poch has more of an idea of what he wants out of this 11 now. He's got one international window under his belt. Um, first game in Kingston. That could be – that's a big test. I mean, let's not write it before we see see the players on the field, but I, I'm expecting two wins. Yep. And, and Nick, there, there are a lot of players that will be changing here. You'll have most likely Chris Richards back, Cameron Carter-Vickers back. You'll have Pulisic that wasn't there for the Mexico game. McKenney, Weya. I mean, there are a lot of players. Tyler Adams now. There is probably eight to ten players that could come in that weren't available uh, for this last camp or were sent home uh, during the last camp. But a lot of it in that Mexico game was they were trying to play calmly through the ball. Nothing was direct. They didn't figure something out in Kingston, on the road in CONCACAF, when the fields aren't good. Is Mauricio Pochettino going to maybe learn a different style? He said he doesn't want to live and die by one style. So it's the time that he maybe figures out how to win on the road in CONCACAF when conditions aren't great and the players maybe don't feel comfortable. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's still, he's going to talk about different styles and, and whatever, but at the end of the day, what he wants to do is, you know, switch of formations. Maybe you play a couple more long balls throughout the game, but he, he is well established to be a possession guy who tries to play a certain kind of way. So I'll believe it when I see it, when we talk about like, Oh, we're going to be this completely tactical, you know, ambiguous team that you'll never know what's coming. We'll always have the answer because short sample size, but 
we didn't really have the answer this past window. So we'll see. You know, a lot of people talking about how many players were absent this camp, rightfully so. Um, that's, that's a big test in Kingston for, you know, uh, versus a Jamaica retool Jamaica side, not one that really, we shouldn't be winning. Like we should win both of those games, but they're definitely not easy fixtures. So I think we're going to learn something about Poch, which is, which is what I want. Honestly, hopefully, hopefully we have a little bit more bite. All we kept hearing this camp was how intense his training sessions were, how he's bringing back the passion. And then, yeah. When he's actually on the pitch, he looks like the same guy who, you know, doesn't react to anything, isn't pushing his players on. And it's fine to have that style if your players have that bite. So hopefully with some of the more senior guys back, uh, we do see that a little bit more and continue to see his tactics. I, I think it'll be it's it's good to get some competitive games and versus a decent to solid opponent. Yeah, I mean, Mike, I think a lot of people were judging quite a bit off of a a Mexico game that was in Mexico. We only have one ever game one there. It was without all of our best players, really. Polsic was sent home. That's kind of the Mexico killer. I mean, it didn't look great, but there were a lot of reasons to, to not look too far into it. In this one, it is a competitive matchup. It's against a Jamaica side that is going to be pretty good. If things don't go well here... I think there's going to be a lot of negative headlines. If things do go well here, it is once again against a Jamaica side that has a lot of pretty good players. Where's the the high and low here of what happens in this camp? If it doesn't look good, and if it does. I don't think the, the stakes are like crazy. Um, I think a lot of the talk that came out of that Mexico game was just noise. That's, that's all it was. People with huge egos who think we're better than we are. Um, people who don't really know ball, thinking that we need to take friendlies super seriously, risk injuries of players. I thought it was really, really negative for no reason. Um, and a lot of the big names in U.S. soccer really looked like they're speaking out of their ass. Um, but they always do that. That's nothing new. We get the same thing every time the team plays. I just want Poach to go out there, play his brand, um, find some guys that are going to work for him. I think the low would be we drop one of these matches um, and people lose their minds. I think the high, we get really good play. We score some goals that are really pretty to watch. And we see that intensity that we've heard through practices, through training camp. Um, we're taking balls. We're turning. We're playing with serious speed and then on the defensive side we're snuffing things out immediately um with that high line those are that's what i'm expecting to see um i'm not super concerned about results i think it's gonna sort itself out um and there are bigger games to play in the near future yeah i mean certainly i want to see the win over the two legs i honestly if it's a draw in in one of them and we get the job done i'm not that Worried. I think after these two camps, we'll have a little bit of a better idea of how exactly it's working out tactically wise, how it's playing, where the vision is. And certainly with players back, with Pulisic back, I think that's the biggest thing because who who is he going to build around in that Mexico game? There was nobody doing anything in that game to be built around. Uh, but certainly an interesting one to watch here. Not going to be an easy game, but certainly gives, uh, as a viewer, a lot of entertaining storylines in this one. A lot of talent on both sides. Uh, boys, let's wrap up our 100th episode. Make sure to subscribe and like if you can, if you're here. Uh, that Messi and Ronaldo interview are coming right up after our shout out of the <laughs> week. So stay tuned. Uh, Mike, we're going to start with you for shout out of the week. Who are you shouting out and why? Uh, two shout outs. The messy transition's perfect. Shout out Inter Miami. They broke the points record um, and in quite spectacular fashion. This was cinema. Uh, New England goes up 2 0 in this game. Messi's on the bench. Suarez is out there, decides, hey, I'm going to turn it up a notch. Rolls back the years. Looks like Suarez of, of the prime of the Liverpool and Barcelona days. Um, first goal is class. Second goal is just a veteran striker who's still got some sass, um, puts it through the guy's legs, a little cheeky turn, fantastic play. And then Messi comes on 
and does what Messi does. I mean, he just took over deft little touches, guys not challenging him um, quickly enough in the midfield, and he makes him pay. Interchange with all sorts of guys. The first two goals are great, and the third goal is special. Um, the link up between him, Suarez, and Campana, the flick, the ball across the box, and then tucking it away. What a great way to end the season. Win the supporter shield, lift it with the guys. Let's see what they do in the cup. I mean, that's the real competition here in MLS. Uh, can they run, make a magic run, and, and end up with another trophy? I'd love to see it. Probably. And, who's uh, the second? and my second, Pablo. Pablo Gavi. Welcome back, baby. Out for a long, long spell with an ACL injury over a year. Um, made his first appearance for Barcelona this season, subbed on. Um, great to have him back. Had so many injury issues, continue to have a lot of injury issues. But this player is pure class, as we all know. Um, seeing him and Pedri back in the midfield together, special. That's good because uh, Barcelona did not have enough of those young talents to uh, put on their 11. Yeah. So glad that he can <laughs> finally be back and get some youth into the squad. Uh, Nick, what is your shout out of the week here? Uh, my shout out of the week was conspiracies because, uh, you know, a lot of things been going on. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it's hey, fair to us start connecting some dots and i've been doing a lot of it this weekend over with the refereeing association but i'm changing it my shout out of the week goes to us a hundred episodes boys that is not easy to do uh it was probably really like 106 because we did like six half episodes or something like that but <laughs> we're calling it a hundred today uh, it's been a pleasure and cheers to 100 like more four episodes because yeah, we, <laughs> like we forgot to mention it we do not forget that it's the hundredth episode. Give us a hundredth episodes, and we'll we'll remember things. You're you're damn right on that, Palmer. What is your shout out of the week here for our one hundredth episode? Uh, my shout out is for head coach Dan Campbell on the Detroit Lions. Hell yeah, I uh, I've never been a Lions fan because they were never good enough for me to be a fan. And uh, <laughs> this guy seems to be changing that. I'm not gonna lie. I'm really rooting for the Lions for the first time in my life. And, you know, if, if they do well this year, if they, if they get into the playoffs and, and, you know, show me something worth, worth uh, rooting for, I think I'm going to have to get a hat. An actual oh, Lions hat. hat. For the Ooh. first time in my not life. Not a jersey. No, a I'm hat. not going to get a jersey. But I'll get a hat. What a hat. Yeah, dude. Palmer's not a too. bandwagon. I want, this, He's I want a, this black hat. You need to absolutely prove it beyond measurable doubt that you're very good before he opts on. That's exactly Shut up right. Shut Yeah. He's a, he's a late adopter. You got to be worth he's, my he's time. He's not hopping on early. Yep. You got to earn my loyalty. Right. <laughs> yeah. Last season All wasn't right. good enough. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Last season was Could've not good enough. Fluke, NFC know. Championship? Yeah, I agree. It Could have been a Could have been. Could have been. Well, my, uh, my shout out of the week maybe should make its way into the NFL. It's chance. Because, boys, if you, if you don't follow the uh, Footy with the Boys Instagram, Mike could Put out a beautiful Everton chant on there. Got me thinking of all of the great chants, including even across the Merse side. The Lucho Diaz one right now is is absurdly wow. good. We've had the uh, pleasure of learning Mauricio Pochettino's uh, he, oh, 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 he's magic, you know. Mauricio Pochettino. I mean, we just need that more in American sports. We need yeah. somebody... In, in Athens, Georgia, in the visitor section, singing about the 50,000th DUI they get to the the tune of Hey Jude or something crazy like that. Like, Facts, I mean, bro. Facts. It's just about damn time we took that from the Brits. We took that from Europe in general. And we made it even better here in America. Make it bigger and better with 100,000 drunk college students screaming songs at players about personal issues that should not be screamed about. I mean... Come on. I, it, we need this. We need this, Mike. We do. I, I expect uh, one of you guys to come up with some chance here for uh, some upcoming U.S. games, some some Arsenal chance, some Everton chance. Maybe a a little Drop a chance in the comments, dude. I, I'll be workshopping. Yeah. I always am. Um, but it's down to the fans. We need some inspiration. Let us know what you think. Um, all the chats I've ever heard in U.S. soccer corners 
pretty ass, pretty, pretty mid. Pretty um, <laughs> so we could do with some serious improvement and there's not a whole lot of competition. We can steal. Just throw in names. We let's add. Let's we will just steal. Throw it in. Let's Dude, the just key steal is to things. not be afraid to be okay. mean. If you're mean, like those are the best chance. We need to be edgy. We need to push yeah, the line. Just don't fucking hold. Push back. American soccer forward by chance. That's what we need. Let us know in the comments your favorite chant. If you feel so inclined, write one for the podcast. We probably won't sing it or use it. But if it's good, I'll sing it. I'll sing it for sure. Who knows? Maybe yeah. Maybe producer P will will give it a, a nice little jingle in our intro. Uh, Nick, give us some closing and final thoughts here on episode one hundred. Episode one hundred. Cheers, some many more. Up the Gunners, baby. That's all there is to say. Mike, episode one hundred. Final thoughts. One hundred episodes. Oh boy, guess who it is. It's footy with the boys. That's our chat. Bring it to the stadium. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> that's I mean, that's uh, it. We, we need to chat. workshop that. We need to workshop that's a, that. That's a chant. I don't know it's if that's a, a chance I was talking about bringing it to America, but we, we always keep it 100 on our 100th episode. Uh, let's just close it off there. We got to go. Chili. <laughs> keep it footy with the boys. We have to get off. Until the next time on our 101 episode, it's been Footy with the Boys. Oh boy, Footy with the Boys.